And we're live. Welcome to our 2 p.m. Hope MD session with Dr. Ben Coley Johnson. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for being with us today. We're going to give our viewers just a couple of minutes to join us. So let's go ahead and, uh, and begin with how your quarantine has been going so far. Well, gosh, that's interesting. Well, I've been quarantined in a, in a really nice place in Bay Point in Miami. So uh, it's been fairly relaxed. Unfortunately, my kids think it's a little bit of an elongated holiday and uh, <laughs> they're, they're happy to be missing some school, although they do miss their friends. Well, we are sure thrilled to have you with us today. So thank you again for your time and also for your partnership. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you, April, for uh, April Donaldson for hosting this on behalf of Hood Living. And I also want to thank Hood Living for inviting me to do this webinar, which I think would will be very informative for all the participants. And timely, especially now. So thank you again. We're going to go ahead and introduce you. Professor Dr. Bankola Johnson is a licensed physician and board certified psychiatrist in the United States. He is a leading neuroscientist and drug and alcohol addiction specialist. Dr. Johnson is a respected global authority in both psychiatry, substance abuse, psychopharmacology, and neuroscience. Professor Dr. Johnson is currently the founder and chief medical officer of Adile Pharmaceuticals, Inc., and founder and chief medical officer of Privé Clinics in Miami at the Four Seasons. Welcome, Dr. Johnson. Thank you again. Thank you, and I'm glad to be on the show. Well, we're thrilled uh, to have you. So let's go ahead and begin. What are the possible psychological consequences of isolation and social distancing? You know, people have really been on lockdown for, you know, a couple of months now, and what are the effects of that? Well, I think that's, a, that's an amazing question. So the, the most interesting thing is that countries have not been locked down like this ever since the Second World War. So you actually have to look back in time to see how people cope. Whereas during the Second World War, there was the impact of actually people being in obvious peril because there were soldiers on the street. But here we have an unseen enemy, which is a virus. The biggest problem with individuals being socially isolated are several fold. And I'd like to cover the first one. The first one is emotional. And because individuals are more socially isolated, they're prone to a range of psychological problems. And I think that this is the next pandemic coming. Individuals are prone to depression, they're prone to anxiety, they're prone to post-traumatic stress disorder, especially if they have had the virus and they have been in the hospital. The second line of concerns that occur is because the virus itself produces um, an inflammatory response in the body, and that makes individuals more vulnerable to a range of other disorders. It may make them more vulnerable to heart attacks, for example, to blood clots, which we all know is one of the causes of death. And isolation, in, in isolation actually adds to that. So if you isolate a person, our people become, have more of a neuroinflammatory response, so they have more difficulty in actually able to fight the virus, which is, seems quite uh, to be uh, rather controversial. So if you get the virus and you're isolated, you're actually at more risk than if you were outside. So this is part of the problem of being socially isolated. And I think the, the, the last is individuals have a sense of both grief reactions if they have individuals who they know have been harmed by the illness, or they have what is called anticipatory grief. And I'd like to talk a little bit when we have time about anticipatory grief. Sounds great. So we'll go there and shortly towards the end. How are stress, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder relevant to COVID-19? Well, the most important thing is, as you know, um, we need to look after the whole person. So the virus attacks various parts of the body and produces severe illnesses. 
Well, the most important control that we all have is our brains and our minds and our ability to function properly. So if you have um, a sense of social isolation and you have a sense of being withdrawn and you develop social anxiety, you develop uh, depressive symptoms, well, your risk of suicide is going to go up. Your likelihood of drinking is going to go up. And the estimates are about somewhere between 30 to 80 percent of an increase in alcohol consumption. Your smoking is meant to go up, and the effects of stress on the body has actually been measured in terms of smoking. It's like smoking about 15 cigarettes a day, which is definitely not good for you. And you also are at risk of suicide. And um, it's estimated that the suicide rate is probably going to be about 15% higher uh, during the pandemic, after, just after the pandemic, which is really quite alarming. The last piece of problems that people uh, get into with this social isolation are family problems. And I had a, a nice conversation with a friend of mine who's a cop, and I said, well, gosh, you know, at this point in time, you hardly must be doing anything. The streets are empty, everyone's at home. And he said, no, 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 Doc. You know, the biggest problem we now have is domestic violence. People are calling us all the time because they're not used to being with themselves for so long, and they're quarreling, and we become counselors. And so that's an idea from firsthand of what people are actually saying. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Have you seen an uptick in issues relating to those things because of isolation, social distancing? I'm assuming you have. Well, there's been an uptick in people with um, alcohol problems. And a good example is not just the United States, which we're a little bit later in the cycle compared to, to Britain and Denmark and those Nordic countries. But they have seen, for example, in Britain, uh, an increase in alcohol use disorder of about 10 to 12 percent currently and in terms of alcohol consumption is probably close to a hundred percent increase. In fact the increase in addiction problems in Britain has been dubbed the next pandemic which everyone is really worried about because the health system in Britain cannot cope with this a deluge of people looking for help for alcohol and drug problems. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Could these, could these be possible side effects from sufferers of COVID-19 by any chance? Well, you, you raise a very interesting question, which from a science basis is quite intriguing. Um, the virus itself can produce, produces inflammation in the body. And basically what happens when you're stressed is your body turns on genes that actually increase the level of inflammation in your body. So at some point, there is an interaction between the effects of the virus and the effects of stress. And therefore, someone who is stressed and who has the effects of the virus as well is likely to be um, quite, um, I would say quite likely to have a very strong immune response, and immune response. And that strong immune response, if it's an overreaction of the immune system, um, creates what are called cytokines, and those cytokines are related to individuals developing very severe respiratory illnesses and having to be ventilated. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Moving away from COVID, you do work to optimize green performance. What kinds of treatments are available and how do they work? Well, this, that's pretty intriguing because um, what I always say is that a lot of us nowadays are very much interested in conditioning our physical health. So we can wake up in the morning and want to take ourselves for a run or run a bicycle or walk the dog. But how many people actually wake up and say to themselves, I'm going to take my brain for a run. I'm going to optimize my brain. I'm going to be cleverer, smarter, and have greater concentration. Uh, I would suspect very few of us think about it like that. And the only time we think about our brains truthfully is if there's something wrong with it, or we have some kind of neurological or neuropsychiatric disease. So one of the things that I've been looking at over the last decade is how to optimize brain function in individuals who don't have a disease. One way of doing it is obviously by um, 
nutrients. There are certain mutant cogenes that improve and enhance brain function significantly, and this has been tested and measured. The second is the use of various oxygenated techniques, including um, hyperbaric oxygen, which we have at, at our clinics. And this allows the brain almost to do two things. It allows it to um, have uh, really, uh, it's to have an effect of reducing the stress level in the brain and making sleep more likely. The more you sleep, the better your brain recovery. And the third is that there are uh, uh, now a good deal of research on various types of magnetic ways of stimulating the brain to improve cognitive performance and attention and concentration in individuals. So there is a range of potential ways in which you can optimize brain function, but everybody has to be looked at as an individual patient and the uh, treatment regimen has to be customized for those particular individuals. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. For those of us who have been at home for a couple of months um, and really just to, to the everyday common day person, what three tips could you give us to optimize our brain function? Well, the, the, the most important thing to do with your brain function is to actually use it. Now, it may sound strange, but most people will have different choices. But uh, I, would, I would actually risk and say that watching television is not using uh, a significant amount of brain power. You have to do something like read or do something creative, uh, whether it be a puzzle or whether it be something challenging or sometimes just talking um, as a mother with your kids or as a father with your kids, uh, you have to do something to engage. There's been a very interesting study that was actually published in England just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and that study showed that people who actually had long discussions, sometimes not always agreeing, uh, seem to enhance their cognitive processes. Now I'm not suggesting people should uh, basically I disagree naturally with individuals, but it seems that being able to have a different point of view and being able to articulate a different point of view improves brain function. The second is that there are a lot of uh, nutrients that we commonly take that in small amounts that are not optimized for most people. For example, uh, making sure you get ad adequate amounts of uh, B vitamins, which are very important for brain function. That means uh, definitely eating bananas, eating nuts. Nuts, fruits are absolutely wonderful for the brain. And there might be some supplements we don't usually come in contact with very often, um, um, like zinc and chromium, which are very important, which may have to be taken in supplements, especially if people are over 50 years old. At the extreme of that, if you really want to optimize your brain, there are certain drinks, um, some of those drinks that I've actually been involved in manufacturing those drinks. And those drinks actually have um, a comp compounds called nutraceuticals. And these nutraceuticals actually cross the barrier in the brain and they actually increase brain metabolism and function. So there is a range of things you can do. You can exercise your brain by doing puzzles. You can eat the right foods and make sure you get the, the, the right vitamins. And you can um, take um, supplements in terms of uh, drinks or other supplements that, are, that you may get either from your doctor or off the shelf. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. So you are the founder of Adile Pharmaceuticals. What kind of medicine is developed there and why did you create it? Well, Adal Pharmaceuticals is a company that is now listed on the NASDAQ, and it's a company that is, uh, has about 80 global patents uh, for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. The idea here is I woke up, um, I would say, maybe not woke up, but I was hanging around the, the Colorado College at Oxford, and I got asked whether I was going to be able to find some way of curing alcoholism, and that was my doctoral degree, but I didn't end up curing alcoholism, but I ended up um, developing and working on a drug called Andansetron, which actually does something really exciting in the brain. So when somebody drinks alcohol, certain parts of the brain begin to fire. And before the alcohol reaches the brain to have an effect, 
I thought this is already priming the person to drink. Imagine if you're at a party and you go in and you meet your friends and they put a drink in your hand. You're already feeling happy long before you have the drink hits your lips. So the dance drum here, the ultra lotus on dance drum blocks these effects of this euphoria and this craving. And we have found out that it is only, it is most effective in individuals with a particular genetic uh, composition. And that genetic composition occurs in about 36 or 37% of people who are in the United States. Uh, the phase three studies or the regular registration studies are currently being done in Europe. But think about it this way. You have an alcohol use disorder. You go to your doctor, your doctor takes a blood test you qualify, you're one of these 36 to 37 percent of people who may be able to take this medicine. You take this ultra low dose medicine and you see your doctor 15 minutes a week and that's it. You continue with your life and for you that is your treatment. Isn't that remarkable? Yes, it is. Yeah, I have another question for you and this is actually from an audience member but it's something I think about every day you know, with our dependence on electronics. What are your thoughts on the iPhone and how it affects our attention spans? Oh my goodness, what a wonderful question. My, 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 my wife asks me that question all the time. Well, the interesting thing is that when the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manuals being developed in, in version five, there was a question whether um, the use of the internet and the use of devices should be classified as an addiction. The problem is, or the problem was at that time, it's still the problem, nobody could think of how it was particularly harmful because by nature, most addictions are harmful. At that point in time, the evidence wasn't very strong. Now, over the last five years, the evidence has gotten stronger and stronger. Um, certainly for kids, excessive use of iPhones or electronic devices is pretty bad for brain development. What it does is it affects, you know, that, a system in the brain, which is called the hypopituitary axis. And it basically switches the brain of, of the child on for longer than it needs to. So the brain doesn't rest, it doesn't become restored. So kids having iPhones all the time and using them electronic devices is really not a good thing. And I believe people do get addicted to devices. And I can tell this amongst my friends, and if they lose their phone, they basically almost lose their, lose their mind or their temper looking for it. Um, now, the problem is, what is the treatment for internet addiction and what is the treatment for iPhone addiction? Unfortunately, we don't have any medicines. And the only treatment um, that I think works is uh, mom and dad saying to their kids, you can only spend two or three hours a day on your computer and for adults to be able to have rest periods. I know some people who don't use their iPhones on Saturdays or electronic devices for periods of the day, but if you use electronic devices for more than four to six hours a day, it's not really, it's not really good for you. It's not good for your brain because your brain doesn't require that much visual activation. And there, there are all sorts of genetic reasons why it's not good, but I won't go into that quite right now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Johnson. What are your thoughts on CMOS as a supplement? Say that again? What are your thoughts on CMOS as a supplement? Well, I mean, I think that it's uh, something that can be tried. I believe that it's um, interesting, but I think that the research on it is not yet quite um, at the level where I would recommend it myself. Thank you. What are your thoughts and tips on daily meditation? How about daily meditations? Any daily medication or? No, daily meditation. This is from a viewer. Oh, for mindfulness. Mindful. Well, I think that daily meditation is absolutely uh, superb. And it's interesting because Traditionally, psychiatrists were not thought, taught about mindfulness. That was something that really happened with people who were in various religious sects or who were really almost cultish by uh, traditional medicine. But over the last 10 years, they have been proven absolutely wrong. And um, in medicine now, we have something called dialectic behavioral therapy, which is based upon meditation. And meditation is very important 
to being in the here and now. So let me give you a very good example. One of the things, and I will touch on this anticipatory grief. One of the things that happens to people in this pandemic is they have anticipatory grief. So what does that mean? It means that you are worried about something that hasn't happened yet, that you don't know whether it's going to happen, but you're just fearful of it, and you feel it's going to get you somehow. So that's called anticipatory grief. It makes you tense, it makes you anxious, it makes you moody, it makes you irritable, it makes you unable to focus. Now, if you were somebody who was interested in mindfulness, you could say to the person, well, you need to stay in the minute and you need to stay in the present. But for most people, that doesn't mean anything. They will just simply continue worrying. But if you say, close your eyes, tell me what is in the room. Do you remember that chair in the room? Where is the chair in the room? Where is the table? Where is the television? Where is your wife? Where is your husband? Where are your kids? Now that brings the person's mind right back into the present. And then you ask them to open their eyes and you see, and you say to them, well, guess what? You didn't get the virus and nothing bad happened. So that kind of even simple trick of, you know, one minute or two minute mindfulness is very important to reset the brain. And I always tell my doctoral level students and all the people I work with that if you have one hour to do something, you should take five minutes of that to meditate and rest your brain and basically bring yourself back into the present. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Are there any vitamins that you recommend for people to take daily for optimal brain function? Yes, uh, vitamin B is very important. Uh, vitamin C is important. Vitamin E is important, selenium is important, chromium is important, zinc and magnesium are very important. Now, the, some of the difficulties people have taking vitamins is, as you know, vitamins are simply packaged in a way that people believe they should be packaged, but they're not specific to an individual. The best way to get uh, your vitamins monitored properly would be for you to come to, uh, to go to a wellness clinic or a clinic like ours and basically have the levels of these vitamins measured and such that you can get an appropriate and personalized package for you in terms of what supplements you should take daily. But just simply going to a pharmacy and picking vitamins off the shelf and taking them um, is probably not the best way to take vitamins because um, if you take too many vitamins, they can have side effects. They have a load on the liver, for example, and you don't want to take too many. You want to take the right vitamins for you at the right time and for the right length of time. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Do you think that ADD can be a sleep-related issue in some cases? And how does ADD affect other areas of, of someone's life? Well, the problem with um, having, uh, I have actually a lot of uh, friends who have ADD and I do have, you know, relatives who have ADD. The problem with attention deficit is that it makes it difficult to focus on the moment. And because you can't focus on the moment, you rely a lot on your memory. Now, memory is complicated because we have two sets of memory, the short-term memory, which is operating as I'm speaking now, and then the longer-term memory. What happens when you have attention deficit is you have to focus on your intermediate or longer term memory. And that means you miss things. You miss, you are not able to focus. And because you're not able to focus, it makes you more likely to be anxious because now you can't predict what's about to happen. So individuals who have uh, attention loss tend to be fairly anxious in general, and they tend to be worried. And the impact of that, I believe you asked me what's the impact on sleep. The impact of that on sleep is that the brain wakefulness, if you like, the, the brain waves that allow your hormones to regulate themselves such that you have a, a nice and restful sleep are perturbed by having too much attention deficit. So your sleep is often broken. You usually wake up in the middle of the night and sometimes you have a lot of um, night terrors if you're a child or nightmares if you're an adult and you have a lot of vivid dreams. 
And while vivid dreams are interesting, um, sometimes they're not very good if you're having them all the time because it tends to make you very tired when you wake up in the morning. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Backing up, how did you go into this line of work? <laughs> Well, I didn't think that I'd be doing this line of work. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, what, one of the things that happened to me was um, I ended up at Oxford University. And at Oxford, uh, one of my proctors came up to me and he said, Bancoli, I've been looking for someone like you. And I said, oh, my goodness, what's this going to be about today? And he said, well, uh, we have... Um, X person who's going to be an expert on the heart. He's going to be an expert on uh, the liver. And you, you're going to be an expert in addiction. And we've made this decision for you. And, you know, in order for you to graduate from this university, you need to go forward and find a cure for this disease. You know, here are a few books and we'll see you back here in about two years. So that's how I ended up in addiction. I didn't really have any real family connection. And I thought I owed it to myself and to my parents to be able to go through my addiction and actually graduate with my doctoral degree uh, rather than worry about it. But once I got into it, I found out that so little was known from a scientific basis that it became a fascinating area of study. And it has really, at this point, um, thrilled me um, in my life and given me a lot to look forward to. And in fact, on my, my will sheet of my car, I have something on the inside of that says, um, let's learn something new today. And there's always something new to learn in science today. And uh, it's, it's just been a, it's been a joy to be in this field. You know, unfortunately, we, we have a lot of patients who, who suffer, who don't get the best treatments, who go to the wrong places for treatment, and we don't have the right setup to look after them in many parts of the United States and the world. And that really sometimes tears my heart apart. But for individuals that are, come within our care or come within the care of experts that I know, we try and give them the best possible uh, life and for, to optimize them, for them to be prepared for a, a bright new future. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Along those lines, are there any new technologies, treatments that are coming out that you're the most excited about? Well, what I'm most excited about is what we developed in Lead Our Pharmaceutical, which is the personalized treatment, because um, that really, in my view, will revolutionize the treatment of alcohol use disorder. Now, because it's going to be so simple, family practitioners are going to be able to do it, everyone's going to have better access to it. Now, if you ask me, what do I worry about at night? I worry about the 63% of people I don't have a genetic um, treatment for, and that we don't ha understand quite how we can get those 63% to the same uh, place. But, you know, research advances, and I'm still... I believe a relatively young man and will continue to try and get a lot more people better. But I think one of the other things is, you know, if you think about something in a general alcohol use disorder clinic, um, one of the big questions is, well, how much do you drink really? And how much do you really, really drink? Of course, you're drinking more than you're telling us. Well, with this personalized medicine approach that we're developing, we don't need to ask questions like that. We'll be able to track your drinking through uh, parts of a uh, part of your genetic profile called mRNA and we can also take pictures of your brain to see um, what your drinking level is like and I think that that's going to really change the way people view addiction because it's going to be a, a medical disease like any other it's going to be like having high blood pressure or diabetes that's what it's going to be like you go to your doctor you get your treatment and you continue in your life thank you doctor um, Sounds a bit like science fiction, but um, my wife says it's like, it's like the future brought forward now. <laughs> What's the best way and the easiest way for someone to see you? Were you doing telemedicine during quarantine? What's the best location for someone to see, to see you if you're accepting patients right now? Well, we're going to be um, obviously doing telemedicine. The other is we can, uh, those individuals who wish to come and see us at our, uh, at our offices, either in Brickell or the Four Seasons can let, can let us know. 
and we'll make an appointment and they can come and see us. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. What about social media? What's the easiest way for someone to find you? Well, we have, um, we have a Facebook um, site um, coming up for our clinics. We're going to also have a web, web link, which is going to come up, I would presume, in the next uh, week to 10 days. So perhaps what we need to do, if people do want to be in touch, is we could um, certainly provide you with uh, an email address that you may want to share with any viewer that is interested, and they can contact us directly through that email, and we can traffic that uh, before the website comes up in about a, a couple of weeks. Great. Do you mind sharing that on air for our viewers? Oh, my goodness. It's pretty long. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what I can do is I can write it down and maybe hold it in front of the, of the camera is what I'm going to do. Um, so it works. Just one second, because it's it's hard to, it's it's long so um somebody in the room is going to help me to write it who is wearing a mask by the way and is going to, <laughs> going to write in and i'm going to to put it up for you so i'll i'll get that done in a it looks like it's going to be done in a couple of minutes so while that's going what are your top three tips for creating routine in quarantine for those of us that are still working from home offices are still home what could you share the most important thing is one, well, I'll tell you the things not to do first of all, and I'll tell you, then I'll tell you the things to do. Um, the, things, um, the things not to do is to think of it as a holiday. It is not a holiday. It's actually far more stressful than a holiday. And it was really interesting the first few days of the quarantine, most people said, gosh, I don't have to go to work. I can just sit at home, do whatever I like, get up. That is a pretty poor idea. You need to make sure that every day you're in quarantine, you stick to your usual routine. If your usual routine was to get up at seven, you get up at seven, if it's at eight, if it's at eight, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to maintain your routine. The second is you need to maintain social contact. Now, this is different for everyone. And it's not as easy as simply getting on the phone and spending hours talking to all the friends you haven't spoken with before or for a long time. That doesn't work well. But you need to create a, a normative environment whereby you say to yourself, well, I'm going to speak with X amount of people for work and I'm going to pick up the phone and speak with these other individuals. So you have some kind of a normality. You need to also devote some time to your family, and you need to also devote your time to exercise. You can use this as a, the quarantine is a great example to learn more about your family. One of the important things that I have seen ha, uh, and read has been the stories of people during the quarantine saying, gosh, I learned so much more about my kids, and I learned so much more about my husband, my wife, and I learned so much more by my friends. So you have to be in a learning mode and try and learn and observe. For me, this has given me the opportunity to spend a little bit of time just simply watching my kids. And I'm always intrigued by watching them because I suppose 50% of them are me and 50% of the, the other part are my wife. So I try and figure out which 50% is operating you know, at different times. And the truth is they're really a mixture of both of us and they, they, they really are our wonderful kids. And so routine is important. The other thing you need to also do is to create some sense of mindfulness. The, the world is under tremendous amount of stress. The stress is coming through your television. It is coming through your phone calls. You're bombarded by stress. Now, we, most people think about stress as somebody shooting at you or bombs going off, but this is just as bad. You know, there is no good news anywhere to be found. You know, you switch on the news channel, suddenly do not watch that 24 hours a day. That is not good for you. You need to create positive, positive ways in which you can channel your energy. So if you're going to, you like watching television or the news, you do it for five, 10 minutes, you remain disciplined. That is critically important because otherwise you will become, you will begin to suffer 
significant amounts of grief reactions. And it, I suppose the last thing is to be optimistic. We will, we will get through it. The world is going to be changed. Sometimes these changes are important for the world for allow, to allow us to rebalance. And um, one of the other things I'll say is once all of this is lifted, it's not going to be life as usual. You know, I rem I'm old enough to remember the days of traveling by air before 9-11. And goodness me, you could walk right up to the plane and you could do all sorts of things. You know, after 9-11, very sadly, our country changed. The world changed. There are a lot of restrictions and a lot of things that you can't do. But we got used to it. And life went on. And things went on. And we, we, we actually had more air travel and it was safer. So the positive message is this too will pass and we will get through it. And it's going to be all right. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And I've got the um, email address for you. I'm going to put it up. I don't know whether you're going to be able to read it, but probably not. Um, can you read it? Why don't you read it for us? And okay. Then I'll it. It's K O L E at P R I V E E hyphen. C L I N I C S dot com. So your last name at Preve. My first name. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my. I'm going to hold this up. I'll see whether you can whether you can read this better. Can you read this better? No. <laughs> yeah. I All think right. it's the easiest thing you read. What to do? Uh, I'm going to do so. Uh, why don't what, I'll give you my personal email. And I will divert it. And my personal email is very easy. It's K O L E J Kilo Oscar Lima Echo Juliet at me.com. M E dot C O M. Mama Echo dot Charlie Oscar Mama. So that's easy to remember. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Okay. I want to revisit something that we talked about at the beginning when you were talking about the personalized and trackable approach to detecting alcoholism and scans and what you would be looking for. What would you be looking for in reading to be able to read that you can see and determine that this person has a, has a, a problem? Well, there, there, there are lots of guidelines to read and uh, the best guidelines actually have been produced by the National Institutes of Health um, and in particular by NIAAA, which is the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And they have produced really nice uh, pamphlets on, and also their website on how much you should drink and what is the limit to drinking. Now, if I told you what the acceptable level of drinking was to be safe, most people would, go, would probably say, gosh, that's too low. But that's the level of drinking at which you will not encounter significant medical problems about. Doesn't mean that alcohol drinking is safe. It just means that that is, I would say for want of a word, safer. So there are guidelines. The, the typical guidelines for normative drinking would be about 14 standard units for a man a week and about seven standard units, seven standard units for a woman. Let me explain to you what a standard unit is. A standard unit would be a glass of wine, would be um, maybe a shot of whiskey, uh, would be a standard unit, and uh, a can of beer is slightly over a one unit. So round about that. And so that's not a lot of alcohol to consume. That's really what our bodies are meant to tolerate. Once you start drinking above those levels, you have all sorts of physiological changes in your body, and that actually makes you either want to drink more or makes you prone to medical um, illnesses. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. This is a question from an audience member. If you're working with a patient and you're not seeing any signs of improvement, how do you handle that? That's a tough one. <laughs> how do well, you judge if they're actually getting better? Sure, well, you know, to me, getting better means a lot of different things. So if someone is coming to see you and they continue to see you, but let's say they're drinking, they were drinking, but their drinking has not changed. 
but they're continuing to see you and their life is changing. You know, their marriage is getting better. Their work is getting better. They're making better friends. Then you continue to work with that person until they can achieve their goal. For most people, the treatment of alcohol use disorder is chronic. And what I like to do is to give people an analogy. You know, if you, for example, had diabetes, well, you'll be in treatment and you'll be taking insulin or your glucose or your glucose reduction tablets for life. And so, so long as you remain in treatment, so long as you remain safe, we will continue to help you. Now, I would say that there is a, a myth with alcohol use treatment. And I can only talk about my practice, but I also know the data extremely well. Most people get better in treatment. And that really just is the, the, the plain, honest truth. Most people who go to um, treatment centers and follow the program and stay in the program get better from alcohol use disorder and actually drug abuse too. So staying on the program, continuing to come back is important. Now, one of the things that we will be doing in our clinics is a highly personalized approach to treating individuals. That means one size does not fit all. You don't come into our clinic and you suddenly just don't get any kind of tablet. We take a very careful and detailed history. We take very careful information. We make priorities. And therefore, we target that treatment towards you as an individual. And I will say in many years of practice, uh, I haven't really encountered many people who don't improve if they continue to be in treatment. So that's, that's, that's a message of optimism. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. This is a question from an audience member as well. If someone has addiction in their family, be it a parent or a relative, are they more prone to developing it? The answer is absolutely yes. So for alcohol use disorder, which we know the most about, um, the, for, for individuals, the biological risk or the risk of having your genetics or other biologies contribute to your illness is more than 50%. So for some people, it could be 50, 55%. So it's actually quite high. Now, one of the earlier studies that were done um, in the alcohol field was looking at the sons of alcoholic fathers. That's what the, the, there was a term was. Now we don't use the term alcoholic, we use alcohol use disorder. And the hereditary risk is quite significant. The hereditary risk of contribution is definitely more than 25 to 30%. So the likelihood is higher in individuals who have alcohol or fathers who have alcohol, had alcohol use disorder. We've also looked at this in terms of twin studies, in studies in which you know one twin has gone to live with a non-alcoholic uh, other parent, and the other one has stayed with an alcoholic parent to see what the rates are. Well, strangely enough, the rates tend up end up being quite similar, and what that means is that the biology that drives individuals who have inherited something that makes them prone to alcohol use disorder transfers irrespective of the environment. Now, there's been more research done in the, in the last few years on children born to alcoholic mothers. And interestingly, it seems that like the genetic predisposition is about the same as being born to an alcoholic father. In fact, there's evidence that it may be slightly worse. So yes, having alcoholic, uh, a, parent, one, well, a parent who's had alcohol use disorder definitely increases the chances of the child from getting alcohol use disorder. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Well, what do you feel like you're the most known for in your field right now? <laughs> well, I think it's changing, it's trying to change the way people think about the alcohol use disorder. And I believe I had a unique advantage. I had a unique advantage because I was challenged to get into the field because uh, my professors told me to do it. And that I think is different from somebody who's had the disease or who knew a lot of uh, people with the disease to start off because it, it, it gave me an open mind. Uh, I had no real preconceptions. I didn't really know much about it. And so everything I learned was through acquisition. And so some of the early studies that I did that were very controversial at the time. For example, with the development 
of uh, the Compound 804 for alcohol use disorder uh, through EDAL, those initial studies were, were happened giving the drug to people while they were still drinking. And um, you cannot imagine how much uh, difficulty I had. I got all sorts of uh, upsetting letters. I got a lot of um, pushback because most people said, well, no, Professor, you need to have these people stop drinking before they get treatment. And my answer was, well, if you had diabetes, you wouldn't turn to the person and say, well, your diabetes has to stop before we give you insulin. So in order for the treatment to make sense, it has to be given while individuals are still drinking. And I would say that that was something that was a long push for over a decade. And now practically every single study in alcohol use disorder is done with some measure of people drinking. You know, even if they're only stopping for a short time, but drinking is important, is an important component. And the FDA and the EMA now realize and have changed their criteria to accept harm reduction, which is not abstinence, as being an important way in which it can help people to reduce the social consequences and the, the if you like, the medical consequences of drinking. So that, I believe, is something that I've really helped to push that barrier. I've also pushed the barrier in terms of personalized medicine. Because when I started off, most people said, well, you know, an alcoholic is just an alcoholic. And this was, to my mind, was just a pejorative term. And that they're all the same. Um, you can't tell them apart. And what we, we're showing in our work is that they're not all the same. And in fact, it may not just be even the same disease. There could be multiple diseases that have this symptom called alcohol use disorder. And so what is happening is by using a genetic way to be able to define people, we're able to give them more specific and more direct treatment. The third invention that I came up with was a drug that is called topiramate. And that was a very interesting discovery because at the time we started topiramate, nobody knew the functions of the drug itself. The drug looked like it did a hundred different things. No one knew exactly which one was more important. And I remember um, going to a conference and presenting this information, and it really wasn't that well received because it wasn't clear what this drug to Paramit would do. But we persevered. We did two studies, including a multi-site study, and um, if you look at the clinical guidelines now, even the clinical guidelines from the American Psychiatric Association, to parameter is on it because the results were really, really very encouraging. And this is a medicine that has not even gone through phase three. And I understand it's one of the most widely prescribed drugs now in uh, certainly on the East Coast for the treatment of alcohol use disorder by practitioners. Now, there are some barriers to using toparamate. It does have significant side effects if it's not given properly, and it has to be titrated very slowly. But in the right hands, um, it works pretty well for the right patient. And we now know that there are, through some new studies, that there might be a genetic profile that will allow us to reduce some of the side effects you can get from using toparamate. So I think I'm known for uh, basically trying to change people's thinking about things. And um, I like to try and change my thinking as well. Uh, and not having, not having too many preconceptions. And I'm sure in 10 years time, there'll be other young, smart people coming, coming by and they'll be changing concept, um, concepts. And really we need to encourage that and bring new ideas to the field. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Looking ahead, coming out of quarantine, going, through 2020, what are final thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers? Well, I think that the most important thing is to take it easy once this quarantine is lifted. Now, various states are lifting the quarantine, but it doesn't mean the danger is over. In fact, some countries that are lifting the quarantine, they have an uptick. What I think the most important lesson of the whole coronavirus pandemic has been, is the resilience of us as humans to find ways to persevere. And I think the most important thing for individuals who are watching this uh, program is to take care of their mental health. If you take care of your mental health, 
you have good friends, you have a great environment, you occupy yourself, you don't allow your mind to deteriorate, you reduce the amount of stress in your life so you don't have inflammatory disorder. Now you have your own body's innate immunity protecting you from what else is out there. The second is to be optimistic. Um, and the optimism is shared by, I think, a lot of people in the sense that there have been lots of viral illnesses and pandemics, and we have all gone through it, and we have got the better, better of it. Now, it's very sad that so many people have had to suffer. It's extremely sad that so many people have had to die. But we hope that you know, we will learn more in medicine and we'll be able to prevent the next viral uh, pandemic from happening. And that is my hope that there are a lot of very smart scientists working on finding a vaccine and other ways to treat this condition. So I'm an optimist. And uh, as I always say to my students, the human brain is wired for 80% optimism and 20% pessimism. So if you keep optimistic, you're really charging your brain forward. And if you're uh, pessimistic, you're really pulling your brain down. So you need to remain confident and optimistic all the time. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And thank you for your time today, for your partnership, for the support of Hope Living and of course our HOTMB partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on your program and thank you to Hope Living. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.